So welcome back to the third session of today. The domain being Rasa Shastra and Dhatu, Evam Dhatu Vignana. We have seen the sources and texts in the morning by Professor Ramanathanji, IIT BHU, and then we went to the schools and thinkers by Professor Omkar Nath Mohantiji, former IIT Kharagpur professor. And now we are going to the cogent statement of knowledge and ideas. Cogent means, what is the meaning of cogent? Has anybody discovered what does cogent mean? Clear. So what are the clear knowledge and ideas from Rasa Shastra and Dhatu Vignana? That part will be taken by Professor B. N. Jagdavji has already joined us. He is with the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. He is a former distinguished scientist and director, chemistry group of Bhaba Atomic Research Centre, Mumbai, and senior professor, physics department, IIT Bombay. He is the chairman of the governing council of the S. N. Bose National Centre for Basic Sciences, Kolkata, chairman of the research council of the National Institute of Science Communication and Policy Research, New Delhi and Chairman of the Steering Committee of the National Programme on Communicating Scientifically Validated Indian Traditional Knowledge to Society. We are so lucky to have such esteemed speakers with us, isn't this? <clears throat> Let's give Professor Jagtavji a big round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And we look forward to your session. Your session is till 3.30 p.m., sir. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start sharing my slides. Uh, well, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here, albeit virtually. And I compliment all the participants for their interest and enthusiasm in the traditional Indian knowledge system. I'm going to motivate this presentation in a slightly different way. And that is in accordance with the proposal of national education policy. Now we know that the Indian knowledge tradition is long, it covers almost everything, all the fields from philosophy, logic, ethics, literature, linguistics, mathematics, astronomy, Ayurveda and medicinal practices, metallurgy and metallurgical chemistry. And this is a long and continuous tradition of great scholarship. This is what we are very proud of. At the same time, we know that in the dim distance past, India was a rich country. India was called the workshop of the world. India had a flourishing international trade, and India had excelled in several fields of technical arts. We rarely talk about this aspect of India, that we were at some point of time very rich. How rich? I'm going to inform you a little later. Uh, while all these practices, they, are, they have become part of our culture, and they have also uh, they have been responsible for our culture to flourish for thousands of years. When I talk about in flourishing international trade, there are great temple architecture where the international trade, the seafaring is described. We know all that. This has become part of our culture. And therefore, uh, I ask the question, why not we talk about these things? Why we were rich? Now, this is uh, as per the NEP 2020. NEP 2020 requires us to produce students who have skills, who have the entrepreneurial spirit, and they will eventually contribute to the Indian economy. And there is no better example than what India did in the past before the British ascent in this country and that is an example which I'm going to put in front of you. Now, many of you must be wondering, 
how rich we were. Well, this is uh, this is data from Angus Madison, the World Economics Historical Statistics, published in 2003. And what is plotted, this is on the y-axis, is the percentage of world GDP. And x-axis is the years. And you can see here, until about 1500, 1600, India was contributing one-third, at least one-fourth or in many cases, in many years, it was contributing one-third to the world GDP. Now, these numbers should make some sense if we compare today's China's contribution to the world GDP is 15%. So, we were contributing those days 30%, 25%, so on and so forth. But this particular data uh, fell after the Battle of Plassey, colonization of India, and when India came under the British rule. And during this period, India lost many of its traditional skills and knowledge. Now, the material prosperity that India enjoyed was because of the ingenious techniques, superlative skills, shipbuilding, expertise in seafaring, and these indigenous techniques and superlative skills made the Indian goods much sought after in the world until 19th century. We'll bring those examples here. And the shipbuilding and expertise in seafaring made the Indian goods reach across the world. Max Weber wrote in honor of the skills of the Indians, the skill of Indians in the production of delicately woven fabric, in the mixing of colors, the working of metals and precious stones, the preparation of essences, and in all manners of technical art, has from very times enjoyed a worldwide celebrity. Now you would ask me the question that what were Indians exporting? Well, uh, the colonial narrative is that India was exporting agricultural products like spices. However, if you look into the history, India was exporting processed goods, the fine quality cotton, dye, silk, steel, metals, metalworks, jewelry, craft, dye stuff, glass beads, paper, cosmetics, perfumes, even sugar lumps. Some of you may know that in the 15th century, the Ming dynasty sent five delegations to India to find out how Indians make sugar lumps. Well, the items which are in the bowl are related to the chemistry and some of the metallurgy. And in all this trade, the balance was strongly in favor of India. The historical documents tell us that the Pliny the Elder he made a statement, he wrote that in the first century that there is a heavy drain of gold from Rome to India. Portugal in 16th century lamented that its hard earned silver from the South American colonies is lost to India. And even British Parliament in the 17th century expressed similar statements. Since gold was the currency that time, India was for many centuries the final depository of a large portion of the gold of the world. And that's how our temples have a lot of, had a lot of gold. And also the Indian obsession for gold is from this history. Now, if you look at the general science and technology of ancient India, I will divide it into two parts. First part is the known knowns. That is knowledge that was documented. It is still practiced in some form. Examples are mathematics, astronomy, Ayurveda, medicinal chemistry, so on and so forth. And we keep talking about it. But there are known unknowns. We knew that something existed in the past. But that knowledge was not fully documented. It was practiced over the centuries, but lost forever in many instances. And there has been a lot of effort to reconstruct this knowledge. Now, which are the areas? The metallurgy, textile chemistry, industry, 
ship building seafaring trade and commerce water conservation agriculture agri architecture so and so forth and how do we reconstruct this this is where we use the evidences from archaeology ancient manuscripts historical documentations remnant practices and scientific validation it's a difficult job but this is all that goes in to construct what existed in this country wherever the knowledge has not been fully documented and i'm going to talk about uh, at least two to three is issues here now let me just uh, flash in front of you the important milestones in indian chemistry and metallurgy which are arrived from all these five evidences the historical documentation the manuscripts then archaeological uh, evidences remnant practices and some scientific validation now period 2500 to 1800 bce uh, the gold silver copper lead gold silver alloy some minerals glass pottery porcelain copper mines of rajasthan existed uh, during this period 1500 to 1800 800 bc copper smelting iron technology extraction of tin making of glass fermentation tanning medicinal chemistry this was evolved 400 600 to 400 bce now we have rust of alloys brass then alloys of steel colored glasses ink amalgams vegetable dyes uh, of course the atomic theory and the concept of compound formation 400 bc which the earlier speaker start the king puru present indian steel to alexander this is a document this is a historical evidence 100 to 400 common era chemical combination preparation of alkalis use of minerals in medicine relation between heat and chemical changes 370 to 375 common era the iron pillar this is the pure wrought iron archaeological evidence this was fabricated at mathura and it was shifted to delhi in 1050 ce 400 to 600 ce pure copper 99.7% pure copper process for hardening of steel arsenic cosmetics 500 ce is the statue of gautam buddha which is the archaeological evidence is a pure copper weighing about a ton 600 ce is the wood steel the crucible steel for making high quality swords exported to damascus and syria and we know in the scientific language it is microcarbide within the tempered martensite 800 to 900 c is the extraction of zinc from calamine of course the process was invented much earlier but industrial scale production started around 800 to 900 c use of mercury sulfide in medicine and 1000 c is the paper making in india 1100 to 1200 c soap indelible ink sulfuric acid uh, is also known as daha jala antimony from stibnite classification of chemicals laboratory practices evolved and 1300 to 1600 the medicinal use of calomel blended perfumes aquaregia and some exotic copper lead zinc and tin alloys now let me just flash two slides on the scientific validation this is uh, a verse from shishruta sanhita uh, and this is on the preparation of alkali well i can read i read the english translation for you some well grown trees in the forest are cut into logs and piled in a place free from strong wind limestone or sea shells should be placed on the piles and then set on fire by stalks of dry plants when all the wood is burned out the fire extinguished the ashes of the logs and the burnt lime is there any disturbance there burnt lime are collected and kept separate and dissolved in water look at this they they, they are 
kept separate and dissolved in water. The extract of the ashes is then mixed with lime water to get the lye, which is separated from the precipitate by filtration. The solution is concentrated to different extent by boiling and it is possible to get dilute, mild and caustic alkali. This is the preparation of alkali given in the Sushrutta Sankita. Now, this uh, verse is also tell you which plants to be taken. Some well-grown trees, but those trees are also defined. Now, this was uh, validated by Acharya Prabhupada. And I have brought to you his test report. Now, he starts with one plant, which is Abhumarga, which is given in the text. Can you stop talking? I'm getting disturbed. If you want me to stop, I'll stop. Now, what Acharya Prabhul Chandravera does is take this plant of Amarga, takes the leaves, stem and root, makes the ashes and using the modern chemistry techniques of elemental analysis, he finds that this particular plant, the leaves contain 17.8% potassium oxide. The stem contains 32% of potassium oxide and root contains 28% potassium oxide. Now you can see here that if the ashes have potassium oxide, then if you dissolve in water, you should get potassium hydroxide. But why this reaction? Uh, the seashells and the ashes are kept separately, dissolved in water, and then they are mixed. That chemistry is like this. The calcium carbonate, which is from the seashells, with the heat will decompose to give you calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. The K2O in the ashes will combine with carbon dioxide to produce carbon, potassium carbonate. Now, these two ashes are now dissolved in water. Now, potassium, calcium oxide with water will give you calcium hydroxide and potassium carbonate with calcium hydroxide will give you potassium hydroxide and calcium carbonate will precipitate which you will filter. So, the filtrate, the filtered solution is indeed potassium hydroxide and that you can concentrate by heating it, concentrating it and so on and so forth. You can make dilute or strong Alkali. So you can do that scientific validation. Another uh, example is preparation of calomel, which is described in the ancient text. I'm not going to read it out for you. This is given in Bhava Prakasha, Rasa Prakasha, Sudharka, Sudhakara, and several other texts. But the recommended procedure is take purified mercury, add gairika. Gairika is ferric oxide, alum, rock salt, Khari Lavana, that is potassium sulfate, and red earth, and place on fire a pot containing this mixture, heat for four days, then pot is covered with a lid, then white camphor-like solid deposited on the upper part is the desired product. And Acharya Profusion did this, and he indeed got that white camphor-like substance, the calomel. Now, likely reactions. Now, there are too many... Uh, elements here, too many materials here, the most likely reaction is alum with potassium sulfate and rock salt produces HCl. Ferric oxide with HCl will give you ferric chloride and water. Ferric chloride on decomposition will give you nascent chlorine and that nascent chlorine combines with mercury to produce Hg2Cl2. Now in all this process, it appears that this ferric oxide plays the role of catalyst. However, our ancient chemists did not know about it. Let's be honest that they were doing it and they were getting the right number. Now, India's mastery over metallurgy is known for ages. In the recorded history, it is known, but much before the history started being recorded, there are also evidences that uh, Indian metals, metal production had uh, gone all the way to Egypt. 
it is it is said that all those egyptian monuments the architectural marvels they used iron tools which were produced in india so there are several of these things now frank bomon who is a belgium archaeologist he made a very interesting observation and this is where we begin our discussion in a formal way it is in the orient especially in these countries of old civilization that we must look for industry and riches of technical ability and artistic production as well as for intelligence and science from the time immemorial up to the industrial revolution the east enjoyed the preeminence of being the workshop of the world and it is significant to know that she was busy in producing the wonderful and massive iron columns that attest to the mechanics and the techniques of the time when chipping a stone and making a hatchet was a superhuman task with western newly now if you keep asking which are which are those wonderful and massive iron columns certainly we are going to talk about the great iron pillar of delhi which was introduced in the last lecture it's over 6 tons uh, and it's a pure wrought iron 99.72% uh, 0.08% carbon 0.03% copper so and so forth but its non rusting property is because of this 0.114% phosphorus 0.006% sulfur and 0% manganese uh, we also in the last lecture it was also talked about the iron pillar of dhar which is the 10th century and the mukambika uh, a temple in the this this is a pillar in the mukambika temple in the second to 6th century is uh, about 8.7 meters and 500 kg weight it is said that the iron pillar of delhi has not rusted because the delhi's atmosphere is dry but also remember mukambika is the near near the sea shore there is a uh, rain a heavy rain there and even there that iron pillar has not rusted so it has a special property why we take pride in this iron pillars we should also talk about several of the artifacts made of that iron technology uh, one was talked in the previous lecture non corrosive iron beam of the sun temple konark 12th century this is a picture of tanjavur canal which was built in 1620 the iron technology existed even that time and this is from jharkhand the trishul of the tanginat temple this is also non rusting iron this is the 12th century so there are several artifacts in this country you will find which are made of those non rusting iron now is also important because iron technology is an important milestone in the civilization any civilization and so also in india the early iron technology started in india approximately 1400 bc however there are recent archaeological findings in tamil nadu and telangana which pushes back this to about 2400 bc so this is the time scale which we are talking about now iron is a hard metal and therefore it is useful for the agricultural practices and also for uh, the warfare now some of you may remember that indus civilization was a bronze age civilization the bronze is a softer material not useful for doing agriculture but when the iron was invented then the second wave of settlement started in that is where it is believed that the human beings started going out of the indus valley and occupying the area in the between ganga and the vindhyas that's the second wave of settlement that started so that you can approximately now date as 2400 bc this technology began independently in india there were other civilizations were also producing iron but there is no evidence that 
we got this technology from any other civilization. Uh, the mature iron technology came up somewhere around 800 BC. And this technology was based on direct reduction process and later on the carburization. I'll explain to you what it is. The iron surgical instrument, as uh, written by Sushruta, they came up around 300 BC. The huge iron pieces obtained by forge building, this technology was established between 100 to 580, and the Delhi iron pillar is one example of that forge welding. This technology was practiced, it continued till middle of 19th century. Now this primacy of Indian iron and steel technology has been recorded in several historical documents. Now Herodotus in the 5th century BC, he provides the first Western account of the use of iron in India. Stasia, who was, uh, who was in the Persia's, Persian kings, in, pleased with his work, the king and his uh, mother presented him two swords made up of Indian steel, and that is what is recorded in the 5th century BC. Uh, Quintus Curtis in the 4th century BC, this is where we find that record, that Alexander was presented 30 pounds of Indian steel. Now those pictures are all uh, uh, made up. Quintus Curtis makes a statement that 30 pounds of Indian steel was presented to Alexander by Horus. Aram Idris in the 12th century, he wrote that the Hindus excel in the manufacture of iron. It is impossible to find anything to surpass the edge of Indian steel. And late in 1897, James Ferguson, an, an archaeology expert, says Hindus at that age, around 400 AD, were capable of forging a bar of iron larger than any that have been forged even in Europe up to a very late date and not frequently even now. This iron finds its place in several of the Indian texts. Now, Yajurveda, it, this is a verse from Yajurveda, it talks about all metals, which also refers to gold, iron, red, iron, copper, lead, tin, so on and so forth. Chandogya Devanishada talks about iron. But remember, this is very interesting verse. Prior to that verse, is a description about how to do yajna, and suppose by any chance your yajna is broken into two parts, how are you going to join them? And the author gives a simile, just like you would join gold by salt, silver by gold, tin by silver, lead by tin, iron by lead, wood by iron, and wood by leather. That is the way you join two parts of your yajna. So this is a metallurgical practice of how to join two metals. Rasaratna Samujaya describes the types of iron. Now, Mundam, Tikshnam, Chakantam, Chatripa, Triprakara, Mayahasmatam. There are three types of iron. Munda, Tikshna and Kanta. And this is, today we know them as cast iron, wrought iron and carbon steel. And then it goes further and says that uh, Mundaloha is of three types, Murudu, Kunda and Kadar. Tikshnaloha is of six types, Khara, Sara, Annala, Taravata, Vajira, Kalaloha. Look at the expertise that these people had in identifying different types of iron. And the Kandaloha, the carbon steel, it has got five types, Dramaka, Chumbaka, Karshaka, Dravaka, and Romakanta. So look at the varieties of iron these people knew. And there are also tests given how to identify a Mrudu from Khara or anything. I'll just show you a few slides. The Mundam is three varieties, Mrudu, Kundam, and Kadaram. 
that which melts easily does not break and is glossy is mrudu which expands with difficulty when struck with a hammer is kunda which breaks when struck with a hammer and a black fracture is kadaram now kantam is five types rama kachamaka karshaka dravaka and roma kanta the variety which makes all kinds of iron know about is called brahmaka that which kisses iron is called chumbaka that which attracts iron is karshaka so this is how a piece of iron is brought close to uh, this kantam what what is the movement of that iron piece based on that this is uh, divided that which at once melts is called dravaka and romakanta is that which when broken shoots for hair like filaments now there are very very interesting description now this description is about kanta iron and uh, this is basically to do with the surface tension that we know today but look at the description if water is kept in a vessel and oil poured over it and the oil does not spread about if asafoetida gives up its odor and decoction of neem its bitterness and milk being boiled in it does not overflow but rises like a peak if such be the characteristics of the vessel know that it is made of kanta iron and then mercury was an important uh, element there were a lot of interest but how to contain mercury and this is what it says the mercury is like an intoxicated elephant and kantham is like a bent hoop wherewith to restrain it so if if you have mercury store it in kantham iron alloying of iron was known uh, the kautilya's arthashastra talks about it for example the superintendent of mint shall carry on the manufacture of silver coins made up of four parts of copper and one six part of any of the metals iron tin and lead hardening of steel is described in brahmas sahita this is a very interesting description uh, and you can see in the slide down there some word called nitriding the nitriding is what we know today but how they used to harden the steel there were two methods given applying paste of gelatin from ships on dung of pigeon on the surface of steel smeared with oil and strongly heating with the sprinkling of water and butter or plunging the red hot iron into a solution of banana plant ash in the butter milk and keeping for one day now ships on and dung of pigeon dung of pigeon especially as ammonia so most likely they were trying to use that ammonia for nitriding of steel but nitriding of steel is a modern concept now that nitriding you can also smell in the second procedure banana plant has lot of potassium so you put banana ash uh, plant ash in the butter milk it will form the potassium lactate the lactate will have the uh, necessary nitrogen then you keep that hot iron uh, in 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 this solution for one day and the surface will get the nitrogen nitride now there was a question in the earlier session about the iron smelting in india the practice now all this description which i have talked about is about the properties the varieties of iron however there is no comprehensive description available in the ancient indian text how do you do this how do you prepare iron from the iron ore so what happens is that much of our knowledge today of the ancient practices is from the practices of asur brijas agarias and lohas these are the ethnic groups they even today produce iron they are the traditional iron smelters so it is believed that the ancient indian iron smelting could be something like what these people uh, these ethnic groups are practicing today 
then we shall discuss this uh, little more detail. Now, what is the process that these people use? It is a solid state reduction process. It's with a clay furnace, and this is where you have charcoal and the ore. Remember, the melting point of iron is 1540 degrees centigrade. Now, the charcoal gives you temperature of 1000 to 1200 degrees centigrade. So, you have the preheated iron ore and charcoal, and this is heated in the bloomery furnace. This is the bloomery furnace. Now, this temperature is lower than the melting point of iron. And therefore, this is the solid state reduction process. What happens in this process is iron oxide, this carbon, carbon monoxide is produced because of the incomplete combustion of charcoal. This carbon monoxide reduces iron oxide and produces iron. However, there is a lot of silicate in the ore and that combines with iron and it forms iron silicate. This is called a liquid slag. So, at the end of this, you get iron with the liquid slag. So, this iron lumps are then hot hammered so that the entrapped liquid slag, it is released from the iron mask and what you get is a wrought iron. Now, if this is a practice of these ethnic groups, this has been also studied. Now, you take a typical primitive iron making furnace, typical operation times of six hours. You have 24 kg of iron ore, and then pour 30 kg of charcoal and blow air at 628 liters per minute. And you can see the output. You have the furnace gases, then wrought iron, and the liquid slag. So you take 24 kg of iron ore. At the end, you get five and a half kg of wrought iron. Now, when we talk about making huge iron pillars of tons, seven tons and ten tons, is it the process that was used? That's the first question we should ask. Because the yield of this process, typically what our ethnic groups do, is about five and a half kg. So, how many times you'll have to repeat this process that you can imagine. Now, there are evidences. Now, Valentin Ball, he was uh, uh, with the Geological Survey of India and he has written a very wonderful book and any one of you gets a chance to read it, please read that, Economic Geology of India, published in 1881. What he says is, although in the typical Indian furnace, the ore is in direct contact with fuel, and it is reduced without addition of flux to a pasty mass, complete liquefaction not taking place, there are still localities in which separately there are departures from this road. So he has surveyed the ancient iron making in India and he makes that statement. In Katiawa, the furnaces are described as being river battery furnaces. For in them, flame produced by the blast or the ignited fuel played over the ore, which was piled by itself and not mixed with the fuel. In Waziristan, a flux of limestone is added to the charge. And lastly, it is distinctly stated that in large furnaces in Virbhum, the iron was produced in liquid condition. So they had built furnaces which could withstand the temperature, that of the melting point of iron, and was run into pigs which were subsequently converted in open herd into malleable iron. And then he says, if we take a survey of the system of iron manufacture as practiced by natives of India, we meet here and there traces of what may be the remnants of higher system of working than those now existing. What are those? What was that higher system? We do not. Let me come to the crucible still, and much has been talked about it in the previous lecture. This is a steel which has got a water pattern, and this is an ultra high carbon steel with 1 to 2 percent carbon, exhibits super plastic properties, that's the ability to change the external shape without changing within, and woods 
is derived from the South Indian word ukhu, and the ukhu means steel in South India. This also said that the Damascus swords were made of this particular steel. And this is amply described in the Crusades. The one blow of Damascus sword would cleave a European helmet without turning the edge or cut through a silk handkerchief drawn to it. The wood was an advanced material of the ancient world. And it was invented in India and it went from India to the world. Let me describe to you a brief history of the wood still. The process originated in South India, somewhere around 500 BC. How do we know? This is from the writing of Greek physician Stasia, talks about those two beautiful swords, and also the carbon dating of the crucibles. In 200 BC, the process was adapted in Sri Lanka. 600 to 1700 AD, this was material was exported to the Arab world and Europe. And it has been mentioned by several of these Arab scholars, Hamza, Jabir ibn Hayyar, Al-Biruni, Arab Idrisi, so and so forth. Now, 1700 onwards, when the Westerners landed in uh, India, they started looking for this woods. It was Indian steel. Benjamin Hand was a botanist. He was traveling in the jungles of South India, and he found at one place the process of making the crucible steel. And he asked uh, people, what, what are they making? They said, Uku, and he heard it as Woods, and that's how the name Woods got stuck to it. Now, these European scholars started sending these samples to Europe. The Royal Society of Chemistry started analyzing the composition of wood steel. Michael Faraday, he wanted to make wood steel. Uh, he, he thought it's an alloy and therefore he makes so many metals, but uh, all his attempts were unsuccessful. Now, as I said, that the woods has got that fine surface and this was the motivating force for the study of microstructures when the microscopes and then the powerful electron microscopes came in the UK and France, Russia and US. So this was a motivation for the study of the microstructures. And then the woods was made using the modern technology. We'll discuss that. Now, making of wood steel. Now, first part is making that uh, wrought iron, prepare iron spot, hammer while hot to expel slag and then follow the process. That wrought iron you seal with the wood chips in a closed furnace, heat in a charcoal furnace. The iron will absorb appreciable amount of carbon and you'll get the carbon steel and pull the crucible to obtain steel. This is tentatively we know of the production of wood steel. Again, I'll bring it to you the Valentin Ball's observation. And this is a very important observation. He saw that practice and he writes, the crucibles made of unbaked clay were of conical form of about one pin capacity into each a wedge of iron, the wrought iron, and three rupee weight of stem of cassia auriculata. This is a flower which is common in the Deccan Plateau which is bears yellow flowers, and two green leaves of a species of Ipomea. This is the morning glory, the blue color flowers. So you put a stem of uh, one plant and two green leaves of the other plant. The mouths of the crucible were then covered with the round caps of the unbaked clay. They were dried and made ready for the furnace. Fifteen crucibles were arranged in the furnace. The furnace filled with the charcoal the bellows were piled for four hours, after which the operation was completed. When the crucibles were opened, the steel was found melted into a button with a sort of crystalline structure on its surface. There were 13 men to each furnace, a headman to make and fill the crucible, 
and four relays of three men each, one to attend and two for the bells. Each furnace manufactured 45 pagodas worth still. Now pagodas was the part coin which was used in that uh, era and uh, uh, 100 pagodas uh, were equivalent to 300 silver rupees. So this whole exercise created, manufactured 45 pagoda worth still. Now, this particular process, as I said, that uh, the Western scholars, they were observing the process, what was happening in India, and they were transferring that knowledge to Europe. And in 1800, Dean Moshe, he took out a patent for converting malleable iron into a cast iron. So that was the first pattern, which was, the, he, he made uh, a material which was very close to the wood steel. John Percy, a noted metallurgist, commented on this patent like this. It is curious that Mushet's process, so far as it relates to the use of malleable iron in the production of cast steel, should in principle, and I may add even in practice too, be identical with that by which the Hindus have from ancient times prepared their words. I cannot discover any essential difference between the two. So the modern iron technology, the inspiration is from the wood still. Uh, now in 1800, there was nothing like the intellectual property rights and the traditional knowledge was never under the purview of intellectual property rights. And also we were uh, under the British rule. So all was permitted. And this is how the steel technology progressed outside the world. Now high quality Indian steel was exported to England as late as middle of 19th century. Now here I'm showing you a paragraph from the world renowned journal Nature but this particular one was published in 1882. And what it says is, even in quite recent days, Indian steel was in considerable demand in England. It is probably not very generally known that a large quantity of the excellent iron used in the construction of Minai suspension and the Britannia tubular bridges was from Porto Neo Works in South Arcot in Salem district. And this Menai suspension, uh, the construction started in 1818. Its length is 417 meters. The Britannia tubular bridge, uh, 1846. The length is 460 meters. The iron used for this was procured from the Porto Neo work of the South Arcot. And that Porto Neo, today we know as Parangapittai in the Kadgore district. Now, Damascus force showed to contain large amount of carbon fibers. Now, all the cluster has some reason. Uh, the recent studies, these are all recent studies. So, Indians had unknowingly used the nanomaterials before 16th century. This is not to say that the Indians knew nanoscience or nanotechnology. It so happened that their process of creating that seal created those carbon nanostructures. On this, Robert Kerr, Nobel laureate in chemistry in 1993, made a very interesting statement. Carbon nanotechnology was much older than carbon nanoscience. For the Damascus world, Indians produced the raw material, mined the iron ore and exported it. Up to the middle of 18th century, the steel swords depended on this particular material and when the mines in India stopped, they lost the technology. Now, why did the mines stop in India? We'll see it a little later. Now, Professor Ramanathan talked about many of these chemical apparatus, but uh, I, I want to motivate it from a different perspective. Uh, uh, see the Mushnati Dosha, Mushaya, Mushati Nikadyate. Crucible is an instrument used for purifying metals. 
and the materials used for crucible are clay and iron. And he also showed you several of these yantrams, which are basically the chemical apparatus. The most, uh, and also this is something uh, interesting, how to establish a chemical laboratory. Uh, you can see from the east, west, north, south, where to keep the materials. But the important thing that I would like to point out that it says the chemical laboratory must be established at a place where there exists plenty of medicinal plants and water. And finally, it says, who should be employed in such rasashala? Those who are truthful. Those who are not going to cheat you. Free from temptation. And are well versed in knowledge of drugs, plants, and languages of many countries should be employed. So that is important. Languages of many countries. That also talks about the interaction these chemists and metallurgists had with the outside world. Now, let me begin one discussion here. This is the downward distillation which Indians had produced, uh, invented, the Tiriya Kapadana. Now, there are two varieties which are given. Uh, now, Rasendra Chintamani, he say, states, the tradespeople fraudulently adulterate mercury with lead and tin. Hence, it is to be freed from these impurities by means of three distillations as given in Tiriya Kapadana. So, it was used for purification of metals primarily. However, this process, the Tiriya Kapadana Yantram, the downward distillation, played a very, very important role in establishing the zinc industry in India. Now, zinc extraction is one of the highest ranking success of Indian chemists and metals. Uh, now, let me just motivate it from the point of view of brass. Now, there are two ways of making brass. One is you take copper and heat it with the zinc ore so that whatever zinc is uh, produced gets into your copper and it produces brass. And this is what Rasaratnakara, the Nagarjuna says. What wonder it is that calamine roasted thrice with copper converts the latter into gold. The calamine is a zinc ore. So you roast copper, then it will it will turn into a gold that is the brass one. Now this is called the cementation process. However, the cementation process cannot produce good quality brass. Good quality brass can be made if you mix copper with the zinc, with the appropriate amount, something like 25%, 30%. And cementation process cannot take you to that level. So anywhere you find brass, which has got 25%, 30% zinc in it, be sure that those civilizations had separated zinc and then mixed that with the molten copper. Now, the procedure for zinc extraction, very interesting. Musham musho pari nasya kharparam pradhametata kharpare prajvade teda jwala bhaven nila sitayadi. This is preparation, but those underlying uh, statements are extremely important. Now you uh, take all that calamine with turmeric, crazy and salts and all that and uh, you put one musha over the other musha. Musham, Mushopari, Kharparam is uh, calamine. Okay? And heat it. When you heat, the Kharpare Prajwalate Jwala Bhaven Nila Sitayati. Initially, the flame coming from this whole thing is going to be blue. When that blue flame changes over to Sita, that is white, be sure that your product is ready. Now, this is an empirical observation, but we know today that if you have musha, mushopari, and you have the carbon source, and if you heat it, then the carbon will, will burn in a low oxygen pressure. It will form carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide will burn. It burns with uh, blue flame. And when all that carbon monoxide is exhausted by the 
but the reduction of zinc ore, the, you will get a white flame. That's characteristic of zinc, and that is where your process is complete. So this much uh, empirical knowledge they have. Now this production of zinc at Zawar, which is in near Rajasthan, in Rajasthan, an international team in 1983 investigated this. And some of those findings I'm going to bring to you. This is a mine at Zawar. The carbon dating shows it is 2000 to 2500 year old. And these are the zinc smelting furnaces. Now these are those downward distillation. Just remember uh, what you have seen here. The actual shape is like this. These are made out of mud. These are brinjal like shape. And here you have the zinc ore and all the substances which will reduce ore into metal. And they are arranged like this. Six by six array. So 36 of these retards in a chamber and that chamber is called poshti. And that is what you see here. These are that poshti here, six by six array here. And what would happen then? This is all going to be heated in the low oxygen pressure. The zinc will reduce and that zinc metal will flow down in the liquid state. It will cool here, and this is where you'll get zinc. Now, the scientists have also estimated the operating conditions and production capacity. The typical temperature here would be again at the coal charcoal fired uh, operation 1150 to 1200 degrees centigrade, low oxygen partial pressure because it is all closed, and operation time is about five hours. Each retard would give you 200 to 500 grams of zinc. So 36 retard in one batch operation will produce 7 to 8 kg of zinc. Now, around these uh, mines, there is a debris of 6 tons of spent retards. And from that, the scientists estimate that in 5 centuries, 13 to 18 century, one lakh ton of zinc was produced in this mines. This is the most outstanding level of industrial production in the Medivh in India. Now, history of zinc is also very interesting. Uh, 700 BC, the zinc ore mining started. There are mines which are as deep as 263 meter by 300 BC. That's the archaeological evidences. You can see here those words. These are the documentary evidences. 200 BC, it is mentioned in uh, Kautilya's Arthashastra. 400 BC to 100 AD, the brass objects from Takshashila and Gangetic Plains. These brass objects contain greater than 33% of zinc. That means people there knew about metallic zinc and they produced that brass using metallic zinc. 100 to 200 BC, Buddhism introduced brass in China. 500 to 1200, brass images of Buddha and deities of Hindus and Jains. This, this comes from the Yuan Sang's writing. Yuan Sang also writes about a full brass stupa and all that. Now, documentation was done by Nagarjuna in 700 to 800 AD. The process existed, but it was neatly documented. 880, there is the evidence for industrial scale production at Zawar. And 11 to 1200 AD, it expanded to the industrial production. 1200 AD, uh, the zinc extraction is reported in Rasaratna Samanchaya. 1400 AD, uh, there is a Bidri art, that is Bidar in Karnataka. Uh, however, this zinc, what they use, is different from the zinc at Zawar that you can see from the uh, how much lead isotope are contained. Now, 1500 AD, the Portuguese took the Indian zinc technology to China. Now, most likely they took it from South India. And in 1740, William Champion established zinc smelting at Bristol. This is where the downward distillation method of Zawar. 
again an inspiration by the indian technology now this is think technology to china the portuguese took the evidence for that is that china exported zinc to europe under the name totamo or tutena which is derived from tatnaga for zinc in south india so you can see those uh, overlaps now as i said in 1740 william champion established zinc metal production at bristol by a process based on the downward distillation method of zawar champion's process used the same arrangement as that of zawar the only notable difference being use of glass retorts instead of the clay retorts of the zawar process in fact it is said that the william champion applied for the patent of this uh, zinc smelting twice that patent was rejected people had doubt that he has copied the zawar process but in third time he was successful and morgan and cradock these are they observed that the champion was notoriously close with details of indian process at zawar possibly a third party described the general principle of the process to champion and why the doubt is like this the earliest factory or earliest settlement of british was at surat and surat was so close to zawar and the zinc produced at zawar used to come to the come to surat so somebody must have informed this william champion how indians do it and he exactly copied the process so this is uh, in today's world you will talk it about talk it like a technology transfer from india to britain but this was merely a copycat thing same thing you can talk about the copper metal technology the 99.7% copper this is the copper statue of gautam buddha 5th century ad sultan of founded sultangan presently it is at birmingham museum uk the traditional copper metal production in india uh, the process was uh, rather straight forward copper ore was founded made into balls with powder why powder it's a wet uh, thing the you can form a ball and they are roasted and they smelted in a closed furnace and refined in an open charcoal fire here is a picture which valentin ball in his book economic geology of india provides for the copper smelting operation in india uh, what he observed and uh, at khetri mines there were 6 million tons of copper ore were mined during 1590 to 1895 and that produced about 1 lakh tons of copper metal so although this looked like cottage industry in combination they were making almost like the semi industrial production allied technology coin uh, of madhugupta which is in the british museum the bronze chola statue of nataraja 10th century or arnamula kanadi that's the kerala metal mirror These are all fine examples of the alloy technologies we have. Our ancient text also record the mineral resources. Where to find those mineral resources? This is an extract from Dhatu Kriya. The copper, the Nepal, a copper rupee. You can read that the copper is found in Nepal, copper rupee is Assam, Wanga is Bengal, the country of Mechas, Romas, and Firangis, zinc. to get at cambodge and roma and bal so they recorded where to get this mineral resources when you have industries and when you have technologies you produce skills and professions and this is what the indian chemists and metallurgists were successful in doing we don't talk about it uh vasayana oh, and sushruta defined 64 kalas in india we say there are 64 kalas what are those kalas these are not only singing dancing or anything examination and valuation of gold and gem art of alloying and separating metals art of extracting alkali knowledge of coloring of gems and jewels knowledge of mines and quarries 
art of piercing and incinerating stones and metals knowledge of combination of metals herbs and plants these are all chemistry and metallurgy related skills trades and professions which were developed in that society and i would also like to bring to you the industrial classes which were dealing with all this these were the skilled men but here there are industrial classes this is from the pali literature which dr baba saheb ambedkar has compiled in the ancient indian commerce his work the vadki is a genuine term and is an embodiment of a carpenter ship builder cart maker and architect kamara is a generic term for a metal craftsman producing iron implement from a plow share or an axe or for that matter an iron house down to a razor or the finest of the needles capable of floating in water or again statues of gold and silver you will be wondering that they could make a, a needle which could float on water and prasanna kotaka is a generic term for a mason not only quarrying and shaping stones but as capable of hollowing a cavity in a crystal a matter probably of requiring superior tools now you can see here the india was rich because of these technical skills that had developed indigenously and that's the message that has to go to our young generation that if we develop skills then we can make ourselves economically prosper now one should also talk about why all these technologies die now there were couple of observations i'm going to provide in front of you uh in 1865 and 1878 the indian forest acts were enacted and that restricted uh, people's access to the forest and uh, therefore the miners could not go into the forest mine or also use the wood which is the source of charcoal so indian forest act prohibited the activities the miners could take because of that the cost would rise you know the second one was in 1878 indian arms act was enacted earlier to 1878 the locals the natives as we were called uh, could possess weapons but it was observed that the local kings the local, local rulers would use that ancient iron technology and produce guns and cannons so once the indian arms act was enacted in 1878 all this stopped and the iron manufacturer which depended on all this just got vanished and also there were unfair trade practices uh, the government of india act of 1848 and which was revised in 18 1888 uh, uh, where the things which were produced in india Uh, the government of india would not buy uh, preference would be given to those who are selling from europe at the same time the industrial revolution in europe uh, made the, the european iron very cheap and just giving you two figures here just five years difference the iron imports in india 1873 to 74 and the cost was around 77 lakh 78824 in just five years it went to 1 crore 22 lakhs 93800 and once the mining stopped as uh, it was indicated earlier people lost the skills and once the skills were lost and all this as i said earlier was not documented in details we lost the entire knowledge and the skills and finally came the indian mine sack but by that time indian metallurgical practices had died down some of you who would like to know about this in details uh, you should read this article explorations in economic history deindustrialization in 18th and 19th century india mughal decline climate shocks and british industrial ascent 
Every country wants to become industrialized. But India was de-industrialized by British. It's a very good article to read. Now let me take a few minutes and ask the question, where did we go from here? Now, there is still interest in the rustless arm, whatever we may say today. And this is a paper in the journal Scientific Reports 2021, uncovering the superior corrosion resistance of iron made via ancient iron making practices. And who are these authors are from which country? You can see here, they're from Australia, Australian Center for Neutron Scattering, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, so and so forth. Now, why nuclear organizations are interested in the rust pre iron? Well, there is a very simple uh, reason for that. Nuclear reactors produce nuclear waste, small amount, but nuclear waste, and this has to be contained for 500 years. So you need a material where you can store this. So that material, that case in which you are going to store this should not rust. So obviously, uh, if Indians were producing, producing rustless iron and it has lasted for 1000, 2000 years, certainly it will last for 500 years and it's a good material for storing radioactive waste. That is the logic here. And uh, there are plenty of projects which are given to the uh, universities in South India uh, I, I saw one rip, one product like that. Why the iron used in the ancient Indian temples did not rust? Again, the arguments are the same. You need a material uh, to store the radioactive radioactive waste. If you start preparing a material now, uh, you cannot test it its uh, efficacy for 500 years. But there is a material which people already have done in ancient India. Now, since you are interested in knowing about the science and technology of ancient India, we have uh, some initiative in this direction where we keep posting uh, new materials almost every 15 days on scientifically validated Indian knowledge. And this was from uh, uh, in CSIR uh, our Honorable Prime Minister made a statement that uh, there is a need to test the traditional practices for their scientific validity. And wherever there is scientific basis available, the same need to be clarified to the citizens. So we have now the initiative called the Swastik Initiative. I happen to be the chairman of the steering committee of Swastik. And the Swastik is operated through NISPAR, National Institute for Science, Communication and Policy Research. This was launched in a mission mode on the call of Honorable Prime Minister. And as a part of this initiative, simplified and creative content on traditional knowledge is disseminated through digital platforms in English, Hindi, and different Indian languages. So you can keep yourself updated. The Swastik presents interesting podcasts, video contents on scientifically validated trends. And uh, it also has lecture series uh, discussions. And in collaboration with my government, uh, this Nispar Swastik brings out interacting activities on topics related to the traditional knowledge, uh, sometimes some quiz or something like that. Now you can see here, this is where you can go and see the content. This content is in 16 Indian languages, uh, apart from English. And those languages are here. We are uh, trying to increase the number of languages. Uh, standalone on NISPER, the reach is 3.5 lakhs. But when it was combined with the My Government, now we have more than 22 million reach uh, in collaboration with my government. And my appeal to all of you is that if anyone of you has any, any idea of uh, some interesting 
scientifically validated Indian traditional knowledge. You can either get in touch with me or you can contact uh, these people, those who are from NISPA, and then a story can be made uh, and taken in the, on the public platform. But remember, the, it should be scientifically validated. Let me give you some examples. Uh, this is uh, one social media campaign. Uh, this is on the Arnamola, the Kerala metal mirror. It's the copper zinc uh, uh, tin alloy. And its reflectivity is like any any good mirror. And uh, this is what is, this, this art has, uh, is continuing even today. Uh, you can see here that we also connect with a uh, lot of traditional knowledge, like uh, in, uh, uh, these are the plants which are used for kidney stones or ki kidney disorders. Uh, these are all this, their efficacy has been scientifically validated. Uh, also the Kala Mega, uh, another plant, which is a very important one. And uh, it was also used for during the COVID-19, uh, but this is again validated. Uh, India has over 20,000 indigenous rice varieties. Unfortunately, we are losing many of them, but there are some groups who are still trying to preserve. And one of that variety is Sambamosa, an indigenous fruit tolerant rice variety of Tamil Nadu. And uh, uh, there is this is a social media campaign on that. Uh, you can see here a uh, uh, lot of description. An important thing is the Sambamosanami is also used as a Siddha medicine. And then when you analyze the content of the Sambha Mosanam, uh, it's a good source of iron, magnesium, zinc, calcium, and it has a high content of protein and fat. Uh, now, Mauryan Empire it was, is known as the first hydrological empire of the world. They used hydrology and hydrological engineering to such an extent. Uh, their uh, irrigation management. And some of you may be surprised to know that the Mauryan, uh, during Mauryan period, they used rainwater measuring instrument called Rolu. This is the indigenous rain gauge. And uh, this is Rolu is uh, 7.4 inch depth, 9 inch diameter hole in a black stone. Uh, this is the indigenous ratio. And uh, this device is also there in parts of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. So you can see. And the Mauryans also had designed manually operated cooling devices like Variantras, the revolving water spray for cooling the air. So you can see all this information. These are all scientifically validated. Uh, when we have the information, then we uh, go to different scientists, try to validate it in a different way. And when we are satisfied, then only we put it on this. And there are lots of lectures you can get on this. And uh, finally, with this, I just thank you for your patience hearing. And if you have any questions, then I would like to handle them. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, my name is yeah. Satyam Agarwal. Sir, can you hear me? I can hear you, but uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, noise around and there is echo. So, if you can, uh, if someone can write his question, I can answer. 
so let me try once so uh, sir my question is like you mentioned so many techniques to extract zinc and steel iron can we use these techniques today to uh, extract uh, this or to make these materials in whatever amount we need today uh, yeah i mean uh, th th this question was also asked in the previous session the my take is uh, like this uh, there are there was something which was achieved those days using the techniques of those days the important question that we need to ask is can we improve the efficacy or the production capacity or the properties by using modern technologies the technological intervention is must let me give you one example which uh, we have worked uh, uh, for quite some time it is said that turmeric is good for health right turmeric is uh, anti diabetic anti cancer anti arthritis and all that but the question that you can ask is that uh, indians uh, day in day out eat so much of turmeric so why they uh, suffer from uh, diabetes or cardiovascular diseases it is supposed to be preventive medicine the reason the lies is the compound in turmeric is curcumin which is insoluble in water and if something is insoluble in water its bio availability is going to be less so howsoever uh, turmeric you may take uh, the it is not available to the body because the curcumin is water insoluble now here lies the idea that can i make curcumin water soluble to increase its bio availability this will require a modern technique so the knowledge and the experience of the ancient indians i am now going to use and put some new scientific idea in it to make it bio available so that its efficacy increases so this is the way one has to take it you cannot uh, see in today's world you cannot use those techniques you have to modify those techniques now in uh, response to the question uh, which was largely discussed in the earlier lecture if phosphorus content makes iron rustless is there a way to introduce phosphorus in the steel making in the of the present you ask the question in a different way don't try to replicate what uh, Uh, ancient indians were doing they were using charcoal that phosphorus was coming from charcoal and so on and so on so let's not do that let's understand what what is the knowledge they have brought to us and can we improve it by modern techniques like kala mega the the uh, example i gave now you eat some leaves it will give uh, improve your uh, a strength and all that and all that uh, earlier times they used to just uh, make a paste out of it and eat it in today's world you don't do that you will extract that chemical from that kalamek and then take one spoon of it so you have anyway introduce some modern technology so that's the way use the knowledge use the experience this is an experience of 2000 3000 years uh is the same way i was saying that if i create a new material today i won't know whether it is going to last for 500 years but there is some material which we know by experience has lasted for 2000 years so why not use that but in order to produce that material i will not build that clay furnace i will build a new furnace i produce it is in the new technology so use that experience that is the way forward yes sir thank you
गुड आफ्टरनून सर थैंक्स फॉर द लेक्चर इट वॉज वेरी इंसाइटफुल तो सर आई हैव टू क्वेश्चन The first thing is you mentioned about. Uh, uh, no, yeah. Uh, is, uh, excuse me. If you can uh, increase the distance between you and the mic, probably I can hear it uh, properly. Otherwise, there is so much of uh, uh, echo. Huh? No, that is too far. Is it okay now? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, now speak. Being arranged in such a fashion uh, with the north, east, west, south direction, is there and uh, chemical laboratories must be present in places where there are medicinal plants and all. So, is there any reason behind it, sir? Or no, I can't can't hear you properly. Uh, I think you speak slow. See, keep slow. Speak slow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So. You've mentioned about chemical laboratories. No, I this is this this word I can't hear. Sir, is it okay now? sir yeah i i am trying to uh, hear yeah yes sir so you've mentioned about chemical laboratories i uh, know you 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 are speaking so fast uh, that your words are mixing it should be very clear Yeah, someone someone is helping you by typing that question. Yeah, that's better, na? Okay, I I can I I I I did hear that that uh, ancient uh, description for setting up a laboratory is that it should be in a place where there are plenty full of uh, medicinal plants. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. See, see, see. Uh, Is there a reason for it? Yeah, yeah I, I, I understood your question. Uh, see, this is a description uh, how to set up a chemi chemical laboratory. Now, there is no denying fact that uh, it should be in a place where there are lots of medicinal plants. See, all that chemistry and metallurgy that was done those days, uh, the ingredients were what. the oils and some vanaspatis roots and vegetable veget the leaves so you need to have those now why anything in particular is placed there will depend on where do you put your mercury first see if i am designing a laboratory i'll first decide the dangerous material is going to be mercury so i will fix up a place for mercury and with respect to that i am now going to arrange other things now then there is no point in asking now why did you place mercury there well this is my convenience so it's like where do i have the origin is my choice so those people had their choices that uh, we should have something like this when you enter you should uh, look at the mercury storage or something like that so once that it gets fixed then other places get start getting fixed there was also an idea 
look, I mean, which I will not uh, fully agree, but in India, the chemical practices were mixed up with the religious practices. Okay, like uh, uh, Professor Ramanathan was talking about Rasaratna uh, Samachaya uh, or some extracts. It's a dialogue between Shankar and Parvati. So every, all that knowledge, the chemical knowledge, is put in the form of the dialogue between Shiva and Shakti. So the religious, uh, see, in, uh, in Indian system, the mercury has some uh, god, god means uh, uh, adhipati, uh, plants have got some adhipati, and their positions are fixed, and accordingly you arrange so one should not be going into those kind of descriptions here. This was what was practiced. What we need to take today is the basic knowledge of what they gathered, what are the processes they developed, and can we make those processes better and use them today. See, one example I'll give you, another example I give you. Until 1850, India was producing the best quality muscle, the malmal, dhaka ka malmal. We lost that. We don't have anybody who can uh, now produce dhaka's malmal. Can we recreate that knowledge? Can we make, and why I'm saying this, that I met one fellow from uh, Denmark, and I was just chatting with him. He said, Oh, his friend is trying to uh, understand uh, the Dhaka's Malmal and he's trying to make it. See, these are the essential parts. Uh, the wood still, the amount of description which I have given you, that should uh, prompt some of us to produce that crucible steel. And there is an important thing here that. The Musets pattern is used dry wood and which is used in all the processes. Whereas Indians use leaves. Now you, you know what when the leaves are heated in charcoal fire, they will not only produce carbon, but they will produce hydrocarbons. Now, does hydrocarbon help to Im improve the quality of steel? That's the question. That's the scientific question we should ask. Yeah, the the uh, see, see we, we we keep talking about the pillars and uh, uh, and uh, canons and uh, uh, the trishulas. You know that this is what we talk about, and we generally do not talk about the utensils. Yes, because uh, something in massive, a massive object, how it is made, how the pillar is made. Making iron, we know it is possible. But uh, forge welding, how was it developed? These issues become important. Uh, but as a utensils, you can take a piece of iron and make it. So not much will be talked about. Uh, sir, Namaskar. Sir, can you hear me? Hello, sir? Yeah. Uh, sir, I just have one small question. In your presentation, we saw that uh, till 1500 also, the economic prosperity was slightly declining. Then from what is that? Economic what? prosperity. You mentioned that it was like, you know, one-fourth of the entire world. Material prosperity. Ji, ji, ji. Ji, sir. Yes. So, though it was very high as compared to uh, uh, the other Sone ki chidiya, it was doing well. But 1500 Tagbi, it was you know little declining. But from 1500 to 1600, there was a dip, and then again it went up from 1600 to 1700. Or uske baad lagatar gir rahi hai. 
तो सर आई वॉन्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड कि उस टाइम से पहले भी क्यों गिर रही थी और वो डिप जो एक बार का हुआ 1500 टू 1600 वो क्यों हुआ Uh, मतलब इस पर अगर थोड़ी सी लाइट हो जाए और इसमें सर रिलेटेड मैंने कहीं पे यूट्यूब वीडियो देखा है सुधांशु त्रिवेदी जी का तो वही कहते हैं कि गौधन गजधन बास धन और रतन धन खान बट जब आवे संतोष yeah, 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 right. हाँ, तो उसमें वो ये कहते हैं कि तब लोग संतोषी थे इसलिए उनके पास पैसा ज्यादा था Just one thing, because sir, you are so gyani, so ye ah. mere, you are so in, uh, profound knowledge, sir. Because I am not able to get this answer from anywhere, so hence I am bothering you. Uh, that no, no, I I just could not hear anything what you are saying. Sir, so can you go in front and ask that question? Right, sir. Uh, that other lady's question I could hear hear properly when she was speaking from the front. Sir, can you hear me now? Sir, can you hear me? Hello, sir. Sir, can you hear, sir? Yeah, I can hear you, but I cannot decipher what you are speaking. Sir, okay, okay. Sir, only the santosh dhan and the prosperity, how they are linked? ये मेरे पूछना चाहता हूँ sir. When people what? Say, when people what? say the highest form of wealth is the santosh yes. dhan, and then you are having a height of economic prosperity at that time. Uh huh. And now you have like. Money is the honey of a man, and still we are down. Hmm. So, Santosh Dhan, how it relate to great prosperity? Yes, it is not that the prapt is, the prapt is, and at that time we were like, "Sunne oh, ki chudiya." Oh, you want to uh, see, see, see. Uh, uh, if if the organizers invite me, I will give one hour lecture on the GDP of India, and what I meant by the material prosperity. Material prosperity will be taken as the GDP divided by the population. it is a gdp per capita when you have a high gdp and i i can give you the numbers of the population that time you will and all this data is available in angus madison's world economics why don't you just go and see that uh, historical statistics he also plots the uh, gdp per capita uh, what is the prosperity prosperity uh, um, is this is the final Sir, I am really sorry, but uh, it was a little different question, and uh, it was like you know when people were santoshi, when they were satisfied. Oh no no no! Uh, please 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 please! Uh, I am not here to discuss the philosophical aspects of uh, happiness. Look, okay. The happiness, happiness. You see, this is this is where we Indians have gone wrong. Let me let me just articulate it in a different way. In India, it is said. It is even said. लक्ष्मी और सरस्वती एक साथ नहीं रहती है तो आप सरस्वती की सरस्वती की तरफ जाएंगे तो आपको लक्ष्मी नहीं मिलेगी बट टूडेज वर्ल्ड व्हाट अमेरिकन हैव शोन अस फॉर लास्ट टू हंड्रेड इयर्स इज विथ सरस्वती यू कैन गेट लक्ष्मी विथ नॉलेज यू कैन गेट प्रोस्पैरिटी यू कैन बिकम रिच विथ नॉलेज वाई इंडियंस आर नॉट गेटिंग इन टू दिस इज बिकॉज दैट ओल्ड थिंकिंग इज नॉट one day i was discussing with uh, young people uh, you are you are you are not that young uh, i was discussing with young people how to increase the gdp of india okay at the end of one hour i got the first question sir paisa hona chahiye lekin uska bhi limit hai na it's a typical indian way of thinking see i have a, i have i'm trying to tell the, the students that you should get into this and make money there's some paisa bhi kitna chahiye to ye kyon karenge is a lethargy and that's why these days i keep telling students that aapke paas saraswati hai to aapko lakshmi milne ka ek sadhan hai why don't you use that instead of doing that we might be just doing uh, uh, this contentment and all that you know this is a wrong thing what has what has come into the indian culture and uh, which has to be taken away if we want to grow economically see the, my my words may look very harsh uh, i know what is mental satisfaction 
but the mental satisfaction cannot come at the cost of having no money why why today united states and china are ruling the roost why are they dictating bhutan cannot dictate we can to some extent see let's remove i mean to your students you should give this message that let's make this country economically powerful Okay, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. I think it was a beautiful lecture, no? How many of us? We can give a big applause to sir. Actually, sir was supposed to be here with us originally, but then there was a clash in his schedule, and he had to change it to the online mode. But nevertheless, sir, thank you so much. I think you have joined us from Kurukshetra, sir. If I am correct. Yeah, yeah. I I did that online, online. in the morning. Yes. <laughs> so thank you sir thank you thank sir you very much. we'll not take thank your further time and we'll also give this session a break because our next session is at 4 thank you sir there are many questions dr deoskar also had a question but again the question answer will take another 5 6 minutes and we cut down on the break so we'll we'll find another mode sir to have these questions reach you by sharing your email with everybody yeah thank you, thank you sir thank you sir namaste sir now thank you so much so i welcome everybody back to our fourth session of rasa shastra evam dhatu vignana since morning we have seen sources and texts schools and thinkers cogent statement of knowledge and ideas and now we have applications and the way forward hindu rasayana from alchemy to modern chemistry by professor pratim kumar chatterjee let's welcome sir with a big round of applause dr pratim kumar chatterjee is a professor at iit kharagpur he received his phd from iit bombay He was a research associate in the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, USA, and FAU, Germany. He has been actively engaged in research in the areas of density functional theory, ARP, Ennio calculations, non-linear dynamics, aromaticity in metal clusters, hydrogen storage, noble gas compounds, machine learning confinement. flexionality chemical reactivity and quantum trajectories he was honored with university gold and bradman seman semeli nani medals in the young scientist medal and a lot 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 many awards he was the convener center for theoretical studies karakpul local chapter in sa council member of crsi member joint secretary educational panel of science academics of india dean faculty and head of the chemistry department of iit kharagpur he was a distinguished visiting professor of iit bombay he has published around 470 research papers book chapters edited seven books and special issues of three journals citations around 21200 in high indexed journals he was in the editorial he is in the editorial board of a number of journals published by american chemical society elsevier springer frontiers group several of his papers have become hot most accessed most cited cover editors choice articles so let's welcome professor pratim kumar chatterjee welcome sir and over to you the session is till 4 5:30 pm sir namaste Okay. Thank you so much. Am I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Is, Good afternoon, sir. everyone. Sir, there is an echo in your voice, sir. Echo, echo, echo. Yes. There is a little echo in your voice, sir. 
here. At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for kindly inviting me to be a part of this endeavor. And what I have decided that uh, I'll just tell you something, say, as uh, the chairperson has already pointed out, this is uh, from alchemy to the modern chemistry and in the Indian context. And here we'll start from our knowledge, whatever we know about the history of science and technology in ancient India and how we can connect it to the modern chemistry. Now, in this, I just try to focus on the strength and the weakness of the, say, Indian science from the ancient uh, days. And uh, there should not be any connection with politics or religion. It would be science per se, as it evolves over the centuries. The two references, you can see I have written The Peacock in Splendor by B. M. Dev from Viswavarati Publishing 2015 and A History of Hindu Chemistry by Prabhula Chandra Ray, Sadhva Prakashani, Kolkata 2002. When I talk about the ancient part, you can see I consider, I have written it over here, pre Harappan or Harappan period, 4000 to 2000 BC, Indus Valley Civilization, 2500 to 1800 BC, Vedic and Ayurvedic Civilization, like 1500 BC to 880, Tantric, 700 AD to 1300 AD, and Yatro Chemical, 1300 AD to 1550 AD. So, that is when I talk about the ancient India or ancient period, I mean. Uh, that particular era, and whatever we knew, uh, we will just uh, uh, give it you a glimpse of those, particularly pertaining to chemistry. Now, at this point, let me tell you one thing: that so there are several aspects over here, which perhaps you don't know. Some of the, say, important knowledge which we have lost. And there are certain things which were misunderstood or misrepresented in the current day scenario. So we need to be very, very careful when we talk about this. There are two broad aspects what I will consider. One, which I will call the fundamental aspects in those days we used to call them philosophy and another is the experimental aspect which was broadly called alchemy. So it was not uh, a part of science per se. In fact, whatever I am telling you used to require some hard work, some toil and uh, your hands rather than your brain they were looked down upon. And in a total society that belonged to, the people who were involved in that, they belonged to, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. So they belong to the lower strata in the society and mostly they were looked down upon untouchables and many of these things particularly I will tell you some important aspects where we were way ahead of Europeans but because of this problem and they were not literate so they could not write down those aspects so we have lost we can see the result 
but we don't know how it was done. One very important uh, example I can give you is uh, like zinc metallurgy, which is uh, in, even in today's parlance, it's very difficult, uh, say, scientific endeavor. But the thing is, in India, at least 2000 years ahead of European, we were there. But if you see the text there, it is only the Europeans so who can uh, claim that uh, they uh, propagated that uh, zinc metals. Why? Because there were mutiny, there were, say, other uh, epidemics, and as it was mostly the typical knowledge was say, restricted to a family or a given uh, community, the whole community disappeared and along with that, the whole knowledge also disappeared. So we knew that was our strength, but now we don't know anything about that. We can just uh, do some uh, back tracing and then we can tell that perhaps this was the situation which was done. So now you can see that uh, even, uh, say, uh, medicine or surgery, which uh, were not considered to be a, a noble scientific profession in those days. And uh, today uh, we talk about uh, this Ayurveda and Clavit with the Veda to give you some kind of upliftment, but originally it was not considered to be a noble So first I will tell you, say, which are mostly uh, people of the higher strata, the Brahmins and others, they used to, say, uh, practice. And that is uh, what I told you in the domain of so-called philosophy. So I will start with uh, uh, something, uh, the concept of atomism, uh, uh, say, around 600 uh, BC. This is the concept of atomism. By Kopila around 600 BC. And his concept of the single unique of any given substance that was based on Sankha philosophy. So what is it say exactly if you just simply let's say you take any material and keep on dividing ultimately you will reach a point after that you cannot divide it anymore. And that is the smallest possible unit. That concept that there exists something called the smallest possible unit. But today we know that uh, they are the atoms or let's say the molecules in a product, say atoms and molecules together, uh, we can consider. Of course, now we know there are subatomic structures or corresponding molecular structures. But now we consider that where you can just simply identify that it is a part of that particular material. And Kapila had that those subatomic particles, they had given the name Tanmatras. So what you have, you have five different Tanmatras. They are the basic units and those basic units you can combine them to 
prepare the larger substance. In fact, the whole universe, whatever material you can see, can be constructed to proper, say, combination of those five tanmatras, they are the subatomic particles, through Kapila Sankha philosophy. And in this case, the Kapila developed the corresponding theory, which you can consider that uh, within course is uh, atomic theory, which was later refined by Kanada. Incidentally, this word Kanada means the particle eater. Kana means particle. So, Kanada extended this and he had given the name first Anu or even Paramanu. But today we know that Anu and Paramanu, Paramanu is basically the atom and Anu is actually made up of Paramanu, so that means uh, the kind of molecule. But that typical nomenclature, that uh, the smallest unit, today we know that uh, we talk about Dalton's atomic theory, but the concept of this atomism, the smallest possible unit, it started in 600 BC by Kapila and later on modified by Kanada. So Kanada started his star. Kapila's work on Sankho philosophy. So Kanada started with This is, he combined two philosophies, Naya philosophy, Naya and Vaisesika. So, Kanada's the concepts of Anu and Paramanu were based on Naya Vaisesika. So, this is a combined uh, Naya Vaisesika philosophy, unlike Shankar philosophy for Kapila. And he considered that there are nine types of different atoms, nine types of different materials which you can combine to form whatever you like. Everything, whatever is available in the universe can be composed of, say, they are composed of these nine uh, specific atoms. Now, at this point, let me tell you, we have a gradual journey and there is a shift in the philosophy in modern science versus the ancient science. In the ancient science, it was assumed that the property of any substance is of prime importance. So, a property determines the structure of a system. But in modern science, we know that depending on the structure of a system, let's say molecule, it will exhibit its own property. Okay? So, he considered the nine types of material. So, four are typical having atomic structure. Earth, water. So you can see what type of atoms we are talking about now. Earth, water, air, fire. So these are the four material. So there are nine. So where you have the uh, typical atoms and uh, 
those atoms are basically uh, forming all other uh, atoms. So he connected this our water, air, fire with order, taste, touch, and color. That means So now you can see, even the atoms, they are telling that this is the unit, R is the unit of name, the order. Water is the unit of taste, air is the unit of touch, and fire is the unit of color. Okay? Now, there are five other which do not have, say, any atomic structure and they are not a material in the sense. So, you have, he used to call it a cox or ether. And this is connected to sound. Then you have deep. Deep means space, calm means time. So you can see what, what we are trying to bring there. And Atman means soul and Manas mind. You compare the atoms for the modern science. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, oxygen, fluorine, neon. We know that they are the atoms, elements. And we have the elements across the periodic table. But if you look at the elements, nine onus, which you can combine to generate anything in the universe, whatever you feel like. And so, what you can see that uh, although the concepts are there, but not necessarily you can connect it with the modern day knowledge. Today, if I want to understand an atom or a molecule, Obviously, you cannot apply uh, the classical mechanics or the Newtonian mechanics where it says that any property can be written if you know its position and momentum. And then you apply some force and the position and momentum will change. You can solve Newton's situation of motion to get, and accordingly you get a new uh, set of position and momentum and get new sets of properties. So you go from one classical state to another through the solution of the classical mechanical equations of motion. In quantum mechanics, where exactly the correct theory to apply for atoms and molecules, you don't have any such property calculation directly. So you go for the Schrodinger equation, get the wave function, and take the expectation value of the operators to get the properties. So you can see the situation, the typical philosophy of atoms and molecules, which are known, they are now uh, far removed from whatever we know today in the modern science. But that you can, in principle, consider that if there exists some smallest possible unit, and those units were also considered properly. You can see that now we are talking about uh, soul, you can talk about mind, you can talk about space, you can talk about time, everything over there. Now, 
I, I, I can tell you uh, uh, something else uh, in this context. So I, I'll come back to that. But let's say that space, obviously you can see there are some small uh, units of space which you can couple to generate larger space. Time, you can have some smallest possible unit. Let's say today uh, we can talk about second. But in ancient, uh, say, Hindu uh, philosophy, we had uh, Paul, Anupal, Vipal, so even smaller and smaller units of time, so that you can just simply plug them to get larger time. So, Atman, Atman also, you get the smallest possible unit of Atman. Mind, you get the smallest possible unit of the mind. You know the current day, let's say philosopher like Barton Russell, they talked about atoms of thought. That means there are simple thoughts which are the smallest possible units which you can couple to get very complicated thoughts. But you can see that the uh, Barton Russell came much later. Here we are talking about say 600, uh, uh, 700, say 600, 500, 400, this is. So in this situation, I will tell you another. Say, and whatever you could see uh, in your eyes. So astronomy, like you can see it on a regular basis, uh, the various celestial objects. So that formed a big chunk of ancient uh, Indian uh, science. Then, obviously, you talk about the bar, death, etc., and the salvation. So, what we used to talk about salvation? You remember Pancha Bhuta. So, uh, let me group this and come back to this at a much later stage. So After death, the mortal body, you have a typical like salvation. And we know that City of Sage Maru Zone. The city is basically up, up is water. Sage is basically energy. Maru is the air. Gom is the ether or the akas, what we had seen. So you can see that. Kanada's Nyavaisya philosophy were heavily dependent on the corresponding concept of Panchabhuta. And how it, it was done? So, even say, when you talk about the, say, formation of various, uh, say, material, starting with these units. You can go for the similar behavior in current day knowledge. Say you go from molecule to atom, then there you have the electrons, protons, neutrons, the protons you can divide into quarks and gluons, and they have different uh, names in the charm, color, uh, order, all these things. So here you can see that uh, 
vaguely you can connect them. When we talk about like this Panchabhuta, actually anything in its solid state, it means the city. So not necessarily only the soil or whatever we call broadly, any solid state is city. Anything in the liquid state is up. Maruti is anything in the gaseous state. So various or let's say tapes is anything in the plasma state. So various states of matter, you can see they are coming into the picture and they are becoming the units over here. So you can see there is a drastic change in the philosophy here say immaterial to material was their philosophy but current day philosophy is material to immaterial that means the properties would depend on the structure originally it was the structures would depend on the properties so you start with the property and then depend the structure i must tell you although it came much later in the Greek philosophy also, the atoms were individual building blocks of the physical world. And there you had the platonic solids, they are the individual building blocks. They differ in shape and size. And there is no other quantitative difference, only the shape and size of those platonic solids. Like atoms of fire, you will tell tetrahedral, atoms of air, they are octahedral, and like this. So, if you compare the Greek philosophy, versus ancient, what you can tell. And as I told you, like our atom as order, and so on. Whatever smell you get, because the arc atoms are entering uh, into your nostril. Okay, so this is something what uh, uh, was the basic Nayabhasasika philosophy, and another uh, developed is uh, atomism theory based on this. Now, here to give not only this. The atom is not the minimum visible unit. Even today, when we talk about the visibility, we have extended our perceptions. We cannot see the atoms with our eyes, but we can see atoms, at least their signature, to some other one. So, how the bulk is produced from the atoms? But uh, today we know how uh, they are prepared uh, to the uh, formation of large systems or uh, forming the molecules and then the molecules they assemble together uh, to go to various uh, molecules. So, So how do you go from atoms to bulk? Let's say I have atom A, I have atom B. So two atoms of A or two atoms of B, Kanadai giving the name diodes. Okay. In today's parlance, maybe you can tell this is something like a diatomic molecule. Is it too high? Hydrogen atoms together forming a bond. The uh, bonding was assumed, but not explicitly mentioned in Kanada's stuff. Bonding means that two A atoms, they are forming a single entity, and that we will call it a. And then you 
add A2 plus B2 and you get triads. It, what say you have uh, triads means three triads will give you a triad. Okay, three triads will give you a triad and four triads will give you a quad. So he developed it in that peculiar fashion. Of course, today we know how the larger structures are developed starting from the smallest possible units. Now, the triads are the say minimum visible unit. That means if you want to visualize, below that you cannot visualize. So you see that concept was also there that uh, you can perhaps go to the lower and lower uh, uh, say dimension, but you cannot visualize everything. But this discreteness is very important. Discreteness means they are not continuous. So you have small units which are discrete. Now today, modern science also, we talk about quantum mechanics where you have everything discrete, like you cannot have all possible, uh, say, energy values. You have only certain allowed energy levels for a given system. So here, if you have some small unit, obviously, you get twice of that or any integral multiple of that unit, you cannot get anything like uh, 2.5 cal, 2.5 beat or 3.7 uh, uh, manos, that you will not get. So this discreteness is very important. Even this atomism of thought that I told you, that concept was a radical concept. But not necessarily all the thoughts should be very, very complicated thoughts. So you have the smallest possible units which you can combine to go for this. And once you have different types of atoms, you can combine them. Like A2 and B2 we are combining. You can combine them. So it was there in our philosophy. You see the Europeans could not appreciate that. But it was in our, there in our philosophy, so we could, in principle, didn't face any kind of trouble when quantum mechanics was developed. I'll tell you, so when Einstein's relativity theory came, he talked about something called space-time. But for ordinary mind, space and time how can you combine space and time? You go back to Kanada's theory. Space is one atom. Time is another atom. Let's say I am forming a molecule, mixing space and time. So space-time, in that concept of atomism of Kanada, we can very easily get the concept of space-time. And there is a conceptual shock for the Europeans, but it was not there for the, I am telling main, main, mainly Europeans, because the modern science which developed there, which I am talking at this moment, they are from Europe. USA or America in general, they came into being as far as science is concerned in much later stage. And to start with, many of them were migrated from Europe. So there was a problem. But Indians didn't have any cultural shock. So when the Copenhagen interpretation in quantum mechanics, it says that you think about any system, 
even let's say an electron or a proton, depending on what type of experiment you are doing to understand that particular particle, it can exhibit its wave property or particle property. And they talked about wave particle duality. So, how come a substance can be wave at the same time and particle also at the same time? In quantum mechanics, it's possible. In classical mechanics, you need not do it. So, you can treat it wave as a wave, particle as a particle. But in quantum mechanics, there is a duality. The same substance will exhibit wave property or particle property depending on the experiment what you are carrying out. So, this type of admixture was not new in Indian philosophy. We know Arthanarishtara is much more bizarre than your wave particle duality. Half male, half female. We know Nishinga Avatar, half lion and half human being. So you can see whether it is space time or wave particle duality. We don't have any problem in understanding mixing two different stuff. And that, if you go back to corner theory, when you have all those small units, and he has given also how, what are the, uh, say, building up or outbow type principles so that you can combine them to form. It's like a game of, uh, uh, say, logo, where you start with the smallest units and form uh, big structures. Now I will go to, so this is something what I told you regarding, uh, say, the philosophy part. Now philosophy part, I will, uh, maybe I will end my talk uh, with the philosophy part a little bit. But now I will tell you the other part where people used to use their hands, not the brain. So I, I'll just consider some of them, say, where Indians did uh, some uh, remarkable, uh, say, improvement over there. So I'll tell you So dyes and pigments. So to coloring something, depending on which particular substance you are going to color, so it would be dyed either it would uh, be there uh, forming a bond or not, depending on that you get a dye or a pigment. And they used many different things from natural sources. It may be Vegetable, it may be uh, or the plant sources, animal sources, and minerals. So they invented this vegetable sources or plant sources like indigo, these are coloring agents, saffron, turmeric, many other, say, animal uh, plant sources they have done. Animal sources, there are many insects like carmes, uh, cochineal, etc. They used. Minerals like cinnabar, charcoal, Red ochre, there are many types of minerals. See. So you can see the so dyes and pigments will form 
a specific chapter in the evolution of uh, Indian science. Then comes cosmetic. Cosmetics, they were used for brightening the face. Then you have eye cosmetic, you used to impart red colors to cheeks and the lips. And here also, there are plant sources, animal sources, minerals. You may not be knowing, there is something called Gorochona, which ladies used to say apply and that is just ox gulgadu that's a cosmetic item sandalwood and also for coloring they use heavy metal and there used to be heavy metal toxicity also even today when people use vermilion there is lead toxicity so you must know that in ancient India there are various directions where you had the uh, say knowledge system. In fact, if you want to see, you need to look into those aspects as well. Then comes the perfume. Now, the plant purchase, you get the perfume from leaves, flowers, fruits, and make use of those perfumes extracted from them. From animals, like you have musk deer, like Kasturi Mriga, Caveat Cat. Now, today, of course, all these perfumes are synthetic because those natural perfumes, they are. Very, very expensive. Even for chemical communication, now people have identified how come, let's say, one insect is getting attracted to the male, is attracted to getting uh, to the female, they are called sex pheromone. So you can study their molecular structure and tell what type of say perfume it is just simply propagating now i will tell you something before i go to uh, the metallurgy part so i will tell you something regarding alkane and that is also very important because uh, that is uh, there in the title of my talk. So I will tell you about the alchemy part. There are two, say, basic requirements of humankind. And the part of alchemy came from there. But the alchemy never got the status of science because it mixed mysticism, it mixed religion, and that is the reason the alchemists were never considered, say, in a very uh, high pedestal, because they were always considered to be that there is no scientific or philosophical uh, background. So what are the two important basic ingredient for humankind? The first one, of course, is the greed. Greed is the important stuff. That is the major driving force. 
Of course, in addition, you have Sara Ripu, Kama, Krodha, Selo, Moho, Madha, Mark, Sarja. So these are the Sara Ripu. You see, I am not telling that they are bad. Because if, if you want to travel in your life, if you want to have your uh, life propagated, they are required, but not in a very large extent. To some extent, they are required. It's like this, say, the toxic metals. You need all of them, but only to some extent. Even you require selenium, you require magnesium, you require all this stuff. But do you know that even if you take uh, iron in a uh, very high dose, that would be little. So, like sadaripu or this type of uh, heavy toxic metal, they are required in smaller scale. But they are dangerous at the larger scale. In case of alchemy, what was their basic requirement? The first one was of course to become rich. And even from those days people knew that because of uh, the stability and also bright color, the gold was considered to be very, very precious. So you need to have gold in order to become rich. Now, astrology, say, as I told you, this mysticism, etc. came into the picture, astrology came into the picture, then people talk about this, that you take metal, you take some roots, you take some minerals, you get various mula or roots, mani kanchana, so kanchana is gold, mani is some uh, say other uh, 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 stuff what you are going to get. Okay, so not necessarily, so they are minerals. And your main aim, so you can see that was. Uh, going to start a business, obviously not science, that you can connect it with the celestial body's positions and uh, go with the typical uh, say astrology and uh, use of some rules or uh, many kanchana and all sorts of stuff. But gold is a metal. Like any other metal, it has its own characteristics. So the first thing what they thought that maybe you can think about the transmutation. You start with any metal which is not so expensive, maybe iron, and do some kind of operation so that it would get converted to gold. Now, we know today's science that changing one element to the other, it's not a chemical process, it's a nuclear process. You have to change the atomic number so that you go from one element to another, iron to gold. So what I'm telling that you can in principle devise a nuclear process which can take you from iron to gold, but the amount of money you would require in order to do that would be prohibitively expensive, but no chemical reaction, what you are doing over here, the alchemist is to do. Apparently, they are not adequate. Scientifically, that's not enough. So the first one is to become rich, getting gold, do all possible alchemical pathways to convert any metal to gold. Second one, you want a long life, you want youth, permanent youth, 
You should not have any disease. And you should have all possible power as uh, your child. So you go in search of the elixir of life, Amruta. Apparently, they could get some at least to that extent. In their context, you'll see somewhere it is written Somrasa. But the Soma creeper, sometimes people say it's a mushroom, it was a creeper. Nowhere today you'll get which rasa, which soma is to give some rasa. They used to prepare a concoction which they used to call amrit. There you give some animal uh, stuff, you give some plant stuff, and you give some metal, mostly mercury. And it was shown, small amount of mercury can improve your lifestyle. And mercury used to be called rasa raj or rasa. And that is the reason we call this so-called pseudoscience as a rasayana, which has become rasayana or chemistry today. But in those days, so whenever it ought to go for the standard of a science, the first thing is reproducibility. You should be able to reproduce your result doing the experiment again and again. Falsifiability is Karl Popper's definition of science. That's the hallmark of science. That you must be able to find out at least, say, one way where your proposition or prognosis must be proved to be wrong. Now, in this case, what was shown that if you want to form the gold, like they wanted to uh, just simply copy whatever they could see. Like they are telling that you can form babies, a purusha and prakriti, male and female. Incidentally, in Chinese philosophy also you had yang and yin. So you must get a counterpart, a purusha and a counterpart of prakriti. Considering their properties, so they started with mercury, which has the property of shining. You remember shining yellow color is the property of the gold they wanted to reproduce. So mercury, and sulfur. Sulfur is the prakriti. The prakriti means it should be a uh, uh, little bit softer. Mercury is shining and it's uh, sulfur is yellow in color. But when they mix them together, it forms mercury sulfur, which is black in color. But you can see, they didn't get gold. But they could show that you can form, say, mercurial sulfide mixing mercury and sulfur. That's a chemical reaction. Now, there are other types of reactions also. I, I, I will tell you important aspect like glass. If you cannot control the rate of cooling, you won't get the transparent property of the glass and you will end up into a typical amorphous stuff. And this is precisely, I would tell you, Indian soil way ahead, like Chinese, in earthenware vessels. But earthenware vessels are all opaque, they are not transparent. They are very bad in glass technology. Whereas Europeans, they are very good in glass technology. 
So what happened? When did they lose the knowledge of science or the propagation of science? You can see that if you are doing a chemical reaction inside an earthenware vessel, you cannot see it from outside what is happening inside. But if you do it in a glass vessel, you can see what is happening. Color change, order change, some paper is coming out, some precipitate is there. So you can have proper idea of the transformation, the reactants to the product. And you can talk about the reaction mechanisms. So you can see the most of the reaction mechanisms, that's why they came from Europe and today from USA. Current day, of course, from India also you get some, but the original, we missed. It's not that we didn't do the reaction. We did the reaction, but we couldn't understand. We get, let's say, the final black product, but we cannot tell what is that, because we didn't have that uh, proper understanding. We could not visualize it properly, what is happening over there. Now I will go to another one, metallurgy. Metallurgy I am telling, although I think uh, Professor Umkar Mahante must have told uh, about the metallurgy. I will tell you, gold, Silver, copper, iron, zinc. Now these are the metals which are extracted from their ores in India. And also we know the alloys like Bronze, like copper and tin, you have Then you have steel, then you have iron, carbon, etc. And so on. So first, let me tell you about these metals. So you start from the ore of the metal. You have to prepare a harness, like for iron, you will have the blast furnace for copper and iron. You heat it. So, you require the corresponding apparatus and also the procedure. Heat the substance so that the ore reaches the corresponding melting point and the metal comes out. Metal gets separated from the other elements present. And we could get the signature that it was known. Like we have seen weapons from older days, older days, surgical instruments, various figurines, like in Mahindra and Harappa civilization, coins, Buddha statue, like Harappa, Mahindra or in Navanda, we have seen. Metallics. Or we know that uh, Porus had donated several uh, swords made up of uh, wood, steel to Alexander. So they were known. Now I will tell you two marvels over here. Then I will go back to the uh, uh, say typical alloys. The Dilly iron pillar. Dilly iron pillar is a typical miracle of what they have done. 
and it was analyzed in today's context and it was shown that there is significant amount of inhomogeneity. It's not the whole pillar has the same composition of various uh, elements like uh, iron, carbon, silicon, phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur, etc. They are all different. And this inhomogeneity in comp composition basically uh, renders the stability of the iron pillar or resistance uh, to corrosion. And there are presence of the slugs and other oxides, they form some uh, inert coating so that the corrosion or rusting uh, doesn't take place. Now I'll go to the zinc metallurgy. It was perfected in India at least 2000 years before it was done in Europe. But zinc metallurgy is not very simple like iron metallurgy. The boiling point of the zinc metal is at least 350 Kelvin lower than the minimum temperature required for the extraction of zinc from zinc oxide. So if you take the typical zinc oxide and heat it, by the time zinc oxide will melt and give you zinc, zinc metal will evaporate. So you can extract it only in the vapor form. So that means you will require both condensation and distillation. And not only that, in the vapor form, it gets immediately oxidized to zinc oxide, or what is called the philosopher's wood. So you require a perfect reducing environment for the extraction of zinc. And as we see, the zinc metal was basically used in the material what we could get in uh, from various civilizations, say Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, Nalanda, and all other places, wherever, in uh, uh, Talwar, in Rajasthan, and in South India, in some places. Unfortunate. There is no written text how exactly this was done. So you can see this elapse. This is our weakness. And as I told you, because the metal smiths were looked down upon by the society, they could not mix with the others. They didn't have proper erudition to write it down. They could not tell it to others. And because they don't have proper hygiene, proper money, proper medication, proper food, they were totally wiped away. And we don't know anything. Only thing, their results are there to see. But we don't have. The credit goes to European, but we were ahead, 2000 years ahead of them in zinc metal. This is something they are painful. And when you talk about the ancient Indian science, instead of telling some arbitrary stuff, what was not there, what was there, we must focus on these aspects. And perhaps we should do a soul searching and also searching of those material and try to go back to the, that era and generate the typical knowledge, what was there in those days, which we have missed. Now about, so we have seen, as I told you, various figurines and uh, other coins, uh, surgical instruments, because surgical instruments, they require uh, various properties. They, it must be uh, very sharp, at the same time, it must not be very heavy. So all those stuff require not the property of one metal, a property of several metals. So we need to go for, say, alloys. Like I told you, bronze, brass, steel, and other alloys, they are known. So we can see their, say, presence in all these aspects. Now let me tell you the current, say, uh, understanding of the phase diagram and uh, 
uh, phase two, the thermodynamics and kinetics of phase change. You see, two solids you cannot mix per se. So first you will have to liquefy. You have to melt both of them. Only at the liquid phase, let's say, you can mix them together. So suppose if you talk about bronze, copper, and tin, okay, you get the liquid copper, you get the liquid tin, but the temperature at which copper will melt and temperature at which uh, tin will melt, they are totally different. So you go to the higher temperature so that both the metals are in the molten state, mix them. But you want to have a solid. You may put it in a uh, dye and get that corresponding clay, but you will have to solidify that. When you solidify that, obviously one will become solid before the other. One will get solidified at a higher temperature. And that time immediately it will come out of the solution. So it's not that easy. There's a modern uh, phase rule will tell. You have to go for something else. Only at a given temperature and pressure, suppose if you go for a specific composition of those two metals, or in case of uh, steel, let's say more than two, then only you will see that the both the uh, metals, you mix them in the liquid state and they would get solidified at a common temperature. That means they will form what is known as Today's knowledge, eutectic mixture, and you get the eutectic point, the lowest, the corresponding lower temperature, where both the liquids would get solidified simultaneously. So it is not an easy job. But the knowledge was known. How it was done, we don't know. Why? Because they could not write those things. They could not tell it to others, but they did. We can see their handicap, but we cannot see that uh, what was the knowledge behind it. So we should be very, very careful about these aspects as well, that whether we can inculcate that particular habit to go back and search for this wherever they were there, Try to see whether some of their relatives or some uh, persons from their community, they still do exist so that we can uh, talk about the actual knowledge, what they had made use of, what was the procedure, uh, what they have done. So this is something what is very important, what we need to know. So I, I, I'll just finish with, uh, uh, say, other aspect, say, which was there in the Hindu Rasayana about those five elements, say, uh, Pancha Bhuta, Ether, Air, Fire, Water, and Earth. So you can see, these are like your city of page Murut Bhum. This was the part of Hindu Rasayana. What it says that ether can be heard. Air can be heard and felt. Heart, felt, you can see, 
to see the fire. Water can be hard, held, seen, touched. Their smell also. What it says that their properties. You can see when you talk about this Panchabhuta, what are their characteristics? Ether, or Jom, which you can hear. Here, when it flows, you can see, you can hear it, hear it, feel it. Higher, you can hear, feel, and see. Water, you can hear it. When it flows, feel it, see it, touch, you can touch it. Heart, in addition, you can take the smell. In which one goes from the immaterial to material, that is, property is a definer of matter rather than structure, which is a very modern concept. Now, in say debate or what we call tarka, so when you have these tarkis, they call it. Patradhar Taila, the Toiladhar Patra. Who is taking whom? In this case, whether a property is of original stuff and the structure is determined by the property, or structure determines the property. So you can see there is a transition from the Previously, we had immaterial to material, but now we are going from material to immaterial, like the matter determines the property, and that is the modern chemistry. And I think uh, I could tell you a little bit of that transition from the typical ancient uh, Indian uh, chemistry or Hindu Rasayana, I am telling, but not necessarily only Hindu or any other. Uh, religious people, they came, they had their contribution also. And then we go to the modern chemistry, and there we can see the current day knowledge and uh, the thermodynamics, kinetics, case rules, quantum mechanics, and uh, other stuff. Uh, we get to the people coming. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor Chatraji. Uh, though we would have liked to take question, uh, but since our venue is shifting tomorrow. I cannot hear anything, please. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we will not be even in a position to take questions. Sir, we will uh, not be in a position to take any questions, sir, because there is some technical shift that we have to do of the venue change, unless we just have one small question, just one. Very small, huh? Because otherwise tomorrow there will be an issue with them. Uh, namaste, uh, uh, sir. ये हमने जब ether, air and fire का ये जो आपने from the current uh, slide this uh, what is written on the blackboard? Are you able to hear me? Am I audible? Okay. Can you just repeat your question? Uh, 
uh, whatever is written on the black board, uh, this white board right now, my question is from the same. Uh, the fourth one, water, heard, <coughs> felt, seen, touched. Are we not, the uh, uh, felt wala hai, wo skin se related hai. Na, to, ye yahan par, uh, mujhe ek ye uh, puchna hai, ki touched ki jaga ye, tasted nahi hona chahi, because otherwise hum paancho mein kai taste wala nahi aapa raha tan matra. So actually, uh, this is the way Kannada propagated this. So you can connect it through Panchabhuta, you can connect it through Panchendriya also. So if you go for Panchendriya, obviously what you are telling is right. And in this case, when we talked about health, actually health means perhaps it will tell you uh, something more than that. Okay. So, uh, if you want to bring in uh, the taste as well, uh, that was not considered uh, toxic. Okay? See. You can see, when I say felt and touched, if you go, uh, let's say, if, uh, this morning time, you can see when the cold uh, air blows, you will feel that air is blowing, but you cannot touch the air. Do you understand? But if you touch water, at the same time, the cold water will give you the feeling. So there is a difference between felt and water. Okay? Take care, sir. Sir, we'll conclude the session with this. Professor Chattaraji, we'll conclude the session. And thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Sir, am I audible? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We can stop. Yes. So, why we had to 